I prefer not to use the microphone. Is everybody good with hearing me? This is pretty good room for audio. All right, so today we're going to talk about measurement. And we have three of the best. The run ideas passed. I'd love to have these sessions be more conversational than they are presentations. So we're just going to do something real quick. We're going to do uh, Andrew, Steve, and Kai are going to run through some, some quick presentations, getting us up to speed on where measurement sits in the business case for measurement. By the way, my name is Pete Pearson. Uh, I work for the World Wildlife Fund. And for an organization like WWF, we are super data driven, right? We, we published an annual report called the, the Living Planet Report. And I think what you'll notice, I mentioned this in the last session, really the things of substance and of value in these conferences and when our ears perk up is when we hear figures or measurement or data on certain issues. And food waste, there's so much that we still don't know because it's not measured. And as soon as we measure something, guess what? It becomes a priority, becomes an issue. This whole 30 to 40% of wasted food, it wasn't an issue until somebody measured it. Right? So this is the key, and this is why I think this session is one of the best of the day, is to make the business case for why this is important. So we're just going to jump right into it. Uh, Andrew probably has some of the most, some of the best knowledge of anybody on why measurement is important in the private sector space. So, Mr. Andrew Jack. All right, thanks, Pete. I'm just going to step over here where I can control this. So, yes, yeah, so uh, I'm Andrew Shackman. I, uh, I co-founded and run a business called Lean Path. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you know, know our work? A few, most, a handful of dumb. Okay, so uh, let's try to figure out how much detail to go into. So, um, we have a business built around that. And we start with the premise that uh, in food service operations, those things which we measure, we can manage. But historically, it has been pretty difficult to measure wasted food. And as a result, it has been pretty lightly managed. So we take the approach that there is a very large sort of elephant in the room in most food service <laughs> operations, as illustrated up above here that uh, is, is waste, and it's avoidable in many cases, it's actionable in many cases, and it's sitting right there, and it's been there for so long that people have become numb to its existence, so um, just sort of tolerate it. And, and this is, it shows up in a number of different faces, but you'll hear it in, in areas like uh, people saying, we want to make sure that our last customer who comes through our buffet gets the exact same options as our first customer. That's, that is an example, for example, of a, of, a, of a policy that leads to a tremendous amount of waste. And we don't question it. We just sort of accept it, that that is indeed how things must be done. That's one example. And there are many others where we have baked waste into our operations. Uh, so the way we make this elephant become apparent to people is through measurement. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's just sort of blended into the background. And we do that just so you have a little bit of context about us. Um, uh, we've been doing this for, at this point, 12 and a half years. We've sort of created this category of food waste smart meters. Um, our, our belief is that when you measure, two things happen. Um, the first is the one that most people sort of would expect, right, which is that you gather insight into what's being wasted. And so the first insight you gather has to do with quantification and sort of magnitude, right? You understand what it is that's being discarded. You also have an ability to calculate the value. Uh, and you have the ability to characterize it, so to figure out not just how much of it, but what, what exactly is being wasted, and to be able to begin to see trends. So that's sort of the understanding and improvement, kind of the analytical side of measurement. And that's, I think, where most people kind of typically start with this problem. Um, I think what we found, though, is that there is an equally profound uh, impact that occurs unrelated to analysis, which is that the moment you begin measuring, you change the culture in a food service operation pretty dramatically, you wake people up. And so whether or not you use the data, you've already implemented an intervention the moment you say to your team, this is important enough for us to measure. So inevitably, when we do this, we hear things like, oh, this is too much work, we don't have time, we don't have labor to do it. And I would say, that means what you're doing is working. When you hear that, that means someone is being asked to change something. Some behavior is actually changing. Because people complain often initially when there's change, and there is that classic change cycle where you go from where you are now into despair before you come back to something better, right? And so 
that is a normal and expected part of the process that there will be resistance. But indeed, that is proof that things are working, that people are having to confront this. So, um, so, so in a nutshell, uh, you know, we see measurement as both an analytic undertaking and a culture change undertaking. Um, we do this work in food service operations. Um, the same concepts, we believe, can apply in a number of other food contexts, although our work happens to be mostly in food service, which would mean places like high volume operations, hotels, casinos, colleges, hospitals, corporate dining facilities, military bases, sports arenas, uh, cultural attractions, those sorts of things. Uh, and we find that when people measure, um, they make a pretty big dent in uh, the amount of waste that they're actually generating. So, um, we do this measurement with a few different tools. I'm not here today to give you kind of a lean path story, but just so you can put some visuals as you're thinking about this. Um, when you look at this, um, all of this is really at, at the level of what I would call kind of micro tracking. Like this is tool, a tool set that's used to record data every single day about everything that's going in the garbage, at least on the pre-consumer side, sometimes also on the post-consumer. As you hear from Steve, you're going to hear about the macro side of this, which is looking at this from a population level. And so today you're going to kind of see this spectrum from bottom-up measurement all the way up to macro forecasting of, of, of the magnitude of the opportunity. So just kind of put that in perspective. These are the tools you need to get down into exactly what is it, you know, why are you throwing it away, taking photos of it, gathering weights, uh, gathering input around the users that are actually involved in generating that waste. And what we find is when people do this, they actually pretty typically cut their waste in half at the pre-consumer level and save about 2 to 6% on their food purchases. So we're here today to talk about business case. So normally I don't bring this slide to educational presentations because it's more kind of a salesy slide. But since we're talking about a business case, I will share with you that this is that, that case. <laughs> okay? uh, and that if you can take 2 to 6% off your grocery bill, it's a big deal in a thin margin business. In many cases, that might be the opportunity to double your actual profitability. So it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a potentially big movement. So that is what Lean Path does. I know we're going to have more of a conversation, so I will stop there. Back to Pete. Yep, and then we're going to turn it over to Steve. And like Andrew mentioned, Steve's going to talk more at that macro level. Okay. And Rock. Yep. I hope so. So while he's getting slides up, um, I want to say that I come from this from a very personal level. I, I really hate waste. Pretty much at all times, you know. I don't, I don't like to waste people's time. I don't like people to waste my time. I don't want to throw anything away, really ever. Um, and I come from this naturally. I actually learned to drive a garbage truck. That was my vehicle that I that I learned to drive on. I was picking up garbage when I was 13 years old. Right? I've gone through the whole open dump burning <coughs> world to the subtitles <coughs> B and C, and here I am working for the EPA. Finally, it's wonderful. Um, as much as I don't like waste, I really, really like data. Data are good in almost every case. Um, it, it leads you to truth, whatever that you know, ends up being. And so my piece of this particular technology has been to try to bring in the actual numbers. Um, you know, they say that 80% of all statistics are wrong, including this one. <laughs> It, it's hard being in the sciences and saying, you know, we're doing 40% of something. Well, that may have been true the last time we looked at it, but it's definitely not true today. And it's certainly not going to be true tomorrow. It might be more, it might be less. You know? The average temperature is always higher or lower than what today's temperature is. Right. So that, that's, there's, the, you know, there's some, some slop in the world of, of data. We're working on several different tools um, at EPA to help publicize this data, collect it in one place, and put it out there for everybody to use. Um, when we started into this, there wasn't a method that we knew about that was national for collecting this waste data. I mean, literally tunneling into, is it 30% is it food waste? Is it 40% food waste? That's a giant difference. The Delta is, is, is you know, the GDP of small countries. Right? Um, we, we actually don't know. Um, so we started to collect the actual data. Let's, let's go right down to it. To the, not, not 3.4 pounds per person per capita, you know? Not, but this institution produces how much food waste? And what about the one down the street? And the one across the river? And then down the road? And count every individual spot. 
So our database, our map, um, currently hits about 2.3 million data points. Okay, it's almost, it's almost too big to make any sense at that point. Um, and so what we had to do is then take the best estimates that everybody was doing, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, South Carolina, and other different places have tried to figure out where this food waste number is coming from. And so we took their numbers, a lot of published reports. We've got a 30-page bibliography if you're interested. Um, and it says that you know an elementary school is going to put out this 1.3 pounds per child per day, five days a week in the Midwest. <coughs> it changes if you go west. It changes if you go east. It changes again when you go south. And we try to average those numbers and bring them in. And so we counted how many elementary schools there were across the country um, and, and figured out how to multiply by the waste per kid. It changes whether it's a day school or whether it's a sleepover school. And then we counted prisons, hospitals. Um, you'll see. It's a, it's a long list. I can't, I can't do it all here. It's coming out at some point, hopefully this summer. Um, I do work for the government, so that's, you know. <laughs> It is, it is a, a slow yet re relentless process. Can you just say the states again, Steve? What the, states that it represents? It's national. It's, na it's national, so it's not just the ones you were just mentioning. Those are the states that, that are the pioneers. They've done maps for their states. So if you go to, um, well, the websites are somewhere. Um, and I, I, they're in the long slide version. Lincoln said, uh, I, would have, I apologize for the length of this letter. I didn't have time to make it shorter. Right. <laughs> in, in the long slideshow, you have links, and I can connect you with those later. But there's states that have done this. Um, we learned a lot from them. We also have a, a document out called uh, Sources, Amounts, and Estimation Methodologies, which is actually collects all the different methodologies that we used, and we picked them apart. Um, and very politely criticize them and say why ours is best and superior, essentially. Um, and, and now, out of date. By the time we publish it, of course, we're out of date. It's a good thing. Um, this is supported by uh, a combination of, of regions and the Office of Research and Development, uh, which is pretty great. What we decided to do is map all the generators. <coughs> And we're inventing language. I didn't know Kai. Okay. Kai got there ahead of me. She published this stuff first, which is great. I'm going to change all the language in my report to match up with hers so we're, we're consistent with any luck at all. But we call them food waste generators. I didn't know that I was supposed to call it food waste. Um, I come from an anaerobic digestion point of view. All this stuff is feedstock to me. Okay. It's not <coughs> food waste or wasted food or appropriate or inedible or all the other different names for it. it it's all organics, nonetheless. No, no, that's important. That's really important. Language is critically important. I, I, I get it. Even though I'm an engineer, I understand that. Okay. Um, and it, it matters from which perspective you're talking. Because if you're talking to a sanitary engineer, they don't care about food waste. They want to know what the water content of it is. Right? Completely different from most of the conversations going on here. For, these, these two days. They want to know what the nutrition value is. My wastewater treatment people don't care at all about the nutrition value. I think overall, though, it's a fundamental shift in how we're all starting to talk about it. And at first, I was kind of poo pooing, like, oh, why are we spending so much time on the language? But it is important. Like, this is feed. This is feeding something else. And the right. more that we can all buy into that, the better it's going to get quicker. Right. It's, it, and it's, it's a wasted resource. And I love the fact that we have a hierarchy that says this is the best use of this resource, and this is the less great use of the resource. And there's some things that immediately fall down to the bottom. You know, banana peels are not much use to anybody. Eggshells. Yeah. 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 Don't do that right now because I'm not sure Tom and I can kind of beat you up on that. Banana peels are actually, are actually edible, but we can talk about that. Later. I'm here to learn. <laughs> Very good. Um, food waste generators. And in fact, if you look at the colors of this, they are in the food waste hierarchy. All right? food, you know, food that can be eaten is, is the green, um, generally. And we work our way down from there. 
Oh, there it is. The first time. I know the first time. Is that the first no, time? I know. It's I know. It's amazing. You should have put that up right at front and center this morning. It's on your program stuff. Can I ask you, Claire, Steve, on your previous slide? Yeah, this isn't really a question, it's a clarification. So I can. Um, you had food, the big chunk on the left. Does any of the food service sector include healthcare, hospitality, higher ed? It's not, it's not meant to. Really? Okay. It's meant to be like restaurants? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Restaurants are by far the largest uh, segment of the population. So what's the hospitality industry? Yeah. Um, the hotels. The hotels. Yeah. Yes. Hotels and, and venues. Um, larger larger venues that aren't restaurants. Benway right. Park. Where do corporate offices fall? Corporate cafeterias. Tiny. Okay. We, 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 could, we could almost find no food coming out of offices. <laughs> there are, and, and then, my apologies to the Sodexo people, of course, that comes, you know, there are lots of lots of offices that get fed, but it tends to be an institution within the office building. So does that go to food service sector then? Yes. Okay. And and if you're a if you're a hotel that has five restaurants, you get five different uh, points on your address. Okay. And we talk to, to each one. Um, and what we're actually looking for generally in this is number of employees. Turns out the number of employees is a better indicator of food waste than anything else. Much better than dollars. Um, it's just a much easier way to actually count. Um, for hospitals, we count beds. Prisons, we count beds. Schools, we count students. And split between sleepovers and, and, and day schools. Colleges, the same thing. Commuter colleges versus uh, the other kind of Anyway. Grocery is in, sorry, grocery is in the second one. Grocery is in food wholesalers and Yes, distributors. absolutely. Yes. Um, and of course, like every other institution, you know, if you ask like the food processors, the manufacturers, we don't have any food waste. Might be true. And, and, and the fact is, a lot of those folks don't have any food waste. Everything goes somewhere, currently. If we only define the things that go to landfill as waste, that doesn't work with the rest of the hierarchy. Is it waste if it goes to a composting facility? Well, it's a less good use than if you're feeding animals with it. So it is sort of, you're wasting the, the, the delta in there, the value change. Food banks. I. Now, I spent a fair amount of time in food banks as, as a volunteer of various kinds. It's very hard to get all this, um, wrap my brain around the fact that one of the biggest expenses of food banks is waste disposal. This blows my little mind. But it is true, and we need to address that. So they end up on both lists. They're both generators and receptors, uh, animal farms. Same thing, generators, receptors. You know, if it's set up properly, um, and if it's in the right state that allows, like Ohio doesn't allow you to feed garbage to pigs unless you put it through an autoclave first. Well, that makes a lot. Might make some sense. Since since managing, I have to be very careful now because I'm being monitored. I have to stay on on, on track. Here. Excuse me. <laughs> the federal government knows what's best. The federal government knows what's best, as do the state governments and the locals. <laughs> this is just a very short, this is the kind of information we have for the 2.3 million data points. Um, I was very interested in looking at this from several different points of view. Coming from the anaerobic digestion world, I know that the big problem for anaerobic digestion is finding consistent sources of feedstocks. We've got the technology down. We can turn anything, almost, into methane. It's great, okay? The trick is to get the contracts and to make it flow evenly through the course of the year. Um, you know, news alert, coming from uh, overseas, um, they now spend um, more money getting feedstocks into their anaerobic digesters. Um, they actually pay for their feedstocks. They're not collecting kidney fees there. It's, it's, it's a completely different um, business model than we have right now. 
But if you're an anaerobic digester and you want to find within 150 miles where your food sources, your feedstocks might be, you can look at our map, draw the circle, draw, pull it up this information, and then you have a guess of, of how much waste they're producing for you, potentially. Uh, two different estimates, high and low, because we use two different methods. You know, we pick a high and low number. And, you know, frankly, they're both wrong. But it gives you a range. Um, I mean, but we're wrong to three decimal places. <laughs> exactly. Um, we don't have phone numbers. Uh, we don't put people's names on here. Those things change too quickly. This data gets stale really fast. I think by the time we publish it, we're out of date. But we're hoping to have something that's updatable on an annual basis. Um, and so that you, if you're a restaurant, um, want to find the food recovery systems within 50 miles of you, and failing that, the composting facilities, um, you should be able to fairly quickly find all of those uh, places that will take your food waste, wasted food. So to put it in the context of this session, Steve, okay. is that the primary business case benefit? Exactly. At the macro level, we heard from Andrew, two to six percent, like this all makes sense to me, right? You cut your food costs and you, right. you have the amount you generate. From a macro level, it's what? Information is power. Yeah. If you know where to get rid of your food that you don't want right now, um, then you have choices. And you can do something inside put it in the garbage can. Um, if you're in Massachusetts and you're not allowed to do that, you have to fairly quickly figure out what your choices are. This will give you that. Okay. Or if you're a business. Or if you're a composter, a food recovery organization, you can say there are 450 restaurants in a 50 mile radius, probably from here. Okay? Which ones should I talk to? Well, let's see. We'll just rank them according to size. And we'll start at the top and we'll work our way down. Or we'll rank them according to a root map that we can draw on this and find the ones that work for us. Or we'll find the ones that only have used vegetable oil because that's what we really want. Okay? That's what we're aiming for with this. We'll, we'll talk about tires later, right? Yeah. Okay. You, can turn it, you want to turn it over to Kai right now? And we'll I will turn it over to Kai because she's like eager. <laughs> I have to go away for a minute so she doesn't beat me up. <laughs> I promise it was Thomas and me together. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. There's a question whether that is available. Not currently. Stay tuned. Um, it will show up on a Region 9 website first, and then it pops out into Region 3 shortly after that. And at that point, it should be national. <laughs> Okay, so our and logic, our logic for this though was again talk micro, then talk macro, and then have Kai come in and talk about the newly published protocol and why language, why all these things are important. So. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Peter. This is a great setup because um, the food loss waste protocol is it's actually it's global, and it, and uh, it's a framework that really bridges across the micro and the, and the macro because it's a gives us a common, the, the Food Plus and Waste Protocol has developed a, a, a common accounting reporting standard that we can use to actually all have a common language. And I'll get into what I mean by that by giving you a little bit of background first. Um, the, you heard um, Doug this morning talk about Peter Drucker, this is Peter Drucker, and another thing he's famous for saying, and you already alluded to it, Andrew, is what gets measured gets managed. And, and it is really, it, you, I know you encounter this all the time, right? But we have no food waste. Well, have you measured it? And now that you've measured it, <laughs> do you have food waste? <laughs> the right answer when they say they have none is, how much do you have? Yeah, right, right, People exactly. People don't how much have none? an answer. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, so in the spirit of, 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 as World Resources Institute um, looked at food waste at a, at, a, at a global level and looked at it in the context of a sustainable food system, one thing um, became evident that part of the reason why we don't really have the greatest numbers around food waste is um, we're not measuring it. And it's really difficult to measure. And we, when we measure it, we talk about food waste in, we say we use those two words, or maybe food loss and waste, four, four words to mean hundreds of different things. So, uh, in order to get some clarity around standardized language and standardized way to account for and then report on food waste, uh, the World Resources Institute, as Secretariat, partnered with six other organizations uh, globally, relevant groups, um, FAO and UNEP, both at the United Nations level, uh, bring in different perspectives. 
FAO is focused on a hunger issue. UNEP is focused on a climate change issue. As we know, food waste is a multi-dimensional topic. Um, the business community was involved with the Consumer Goods Forum, which is a membership of uh, the world's largest food retailers and manufacturers. World Business Council for Sustainable Development also represents the private sector. And then two other partners are really are food waste experts, Rapid Fusions, who many of you may have heard of. They work um, primarily in Europe. So together, this group came together uh, close to three years ago now and said, all right, we're going to develop a, a uh, food loss and waste accounting and reporting standards that globally, whether you are a producer of, of uh, barley in Burkina Faso or a retailer in the United States or a manufacturer in Bangladesh, you can use a common accounting and reporting framework to report on your food waste numbers. So it took us um, three years to develop it with a lot of input from a lot of people in this room and outside this room and 200 plus stakeholders to come to consensus on what is a common standard that we could use that could be applicable in multiple situations to report on food loss and waste in a more consistent and transparent way. Uh, so we now have, this is, there's a long word, the full standard is lengthy, this is the short 12 page executive summary, I'm happy to report, we boiled it down. <laughs> um, and the, uh, I, I have some copies here, it's also downloadable on our website, launched uh, June 6th, so just um, a few weeks ago, we launched the Food Loss and Waste Accounting Reporting Standard. And I'll, it, in a nutshell, this is a bit of a long sentence, but, but what it really is, is it is a global standard. And uh, we call it Food Loss and Waste Sympathy because that's the common term. But really, we couldn't find a good acronym for what it, what it really uh, is about. It's, it's quantifying and reporting on the weight of food and or associated inedible parts, those banana skins, um, that were removed from the food supply chain. So removed from being fed to people. That long phrase, food and or associated inedible parts, removed from the food supply chain does not boil down to an easy acronym. We had <laughs> discussions at the steering committee level about this and decided that we were just going to stick with the term food loss and waste. Um, but basically that's what it refers to. Is if it's been an item that was intended for consumption or is attached to an item intended for consumption and no longer is feeding people to the top of that, that, that inverted pyramid. And so the standard again allows for inventories to be reported using common language so that you do have some international consistency and transparency um, and it's a voluntary standard. Um, there's, there's, it's not a third-party certified standard at this point unless somebody else, comes up, some, an auditor comes up with a way to, to, to uh, audit against it. But um, it can be used internally by a company to do benchmarking amongst their own operations. It could be used by uh, a third party like the CDP who, if they want to have a reporting hub for food waste figures. Um, there's uh, lots of ways that the standard could be used for different groups depending on what their purposes are for measuring and reporting in the first place. Uh, these are just some of the faces of people who were involved uh, over the 200 plus stakeholders. Andrew, I'm not sure if you made it to this slide or not. Making but, right. uh, oh, well. yep, yep, top set right there. All right, right there. <laughs> right in the middle, the front and center. <laughs> um, well, we did have you know, a real cross section of you know, people across the continent um, and across the world from all continents. And if there is a precedence for this. Anybody familiar with the greenhouse gas protocol, the GHG standards? So when you're 15 years ago, carbon accounting was in the same situation where there were different accounting methods, not common language and terminology, and the World Resources Institute served as secretary as well, came up with a greenhouse gas standard, and now it's used globally as the foundation for a lot of different reporting frameworks and by hundreds of thousands, of thousands of businesses and hundreds of different programs. So that's um, Perhaps where this food loss and waste standard will, will go as well. It'll be used as a foundation for measuring whether it's EPA or at the macro level or uh, lean tax clients at the, at the micro level. And the, um, I'll skip past these guiding principles in the interest of time, but this is basically how we now broke down what do we mean by food loss and, and waste. Because again, it can mean many different things. Um, and this, you can't read what's in the bottom. That's, I, kept that in there for the purposes of the, um, the slides that we shared afterwards to explain what we're looking at. But if you think about it basically, right, there's food plants, fungi, animals, start out being grown, raised for humans to be consumed in some way. Um, there's a, there is, in most produce, most animal parts, there's a part that we, people consider is intended for to be eaten, whether it's a banana flesh, Inedible parts, maybe the banana skin, but I've actually learned that throughout the world, what we consider inedible here in the US is not what people consider inedible elsewhere. So chicken feet is the classic example. Mm. Eaten in China, 
the delicacy not eaten here in the U.S. So that what's food and what's an edible part is very much subject to uh, cultural convention and a host of other factors. But suffice it to say, of that food, there is food consumed. That's the white box on the far left there. Um, and if it goes to feed people in some way, whether it's food donation or otherwise, uh, it's not within the scope of the accounting reporting standard because it's still within the food supply chain. When it leaves the food supply chain, it's within this yellow box. And it may be the green arrow, which is food that was not consumed, for whatever reason, it may have been sold perfectly fit for consumption, but or it may have been spoiled, but it was it was intended to be eaten, and that's what food is defined as intended for human consumption. And the inedible parts are also uh, leaving the food system because they they were they were not intended for human consumption. Both of those pieces can go to what we define as ten possible destinations. So when we talk about the loss or waste, you know, what do you mean? <laughs> is it all ten destinations from animal feed to you know, all the way to landfill, to not harvested, plowed in. And if you look, can think about it from a just purely logical perspective, a, an inventory that has all 10 destinations in, in its measurement is going to be very different than an inventory that only includes three of the destinations. So EPA's measurements only have some of these destinations in their calculations, and USDA's measurements have all 10 destinations. And, Again, that's all perfectly fine. The key is to be clear in disclosing what is actually included. So until we know what is included, it's really hard to make any kind of thoughtful decision without um, to, to reduce it because you don't know what you're trying to reduce it. You know, are you trying to make, move it up in hierarchy or just um, focusing on keeping it out of landfill? What is controlled combustion? <laughs> that's a, we call it the incineration. It's in a combusted in a controlled facility, which would be different than an open burn. So again, this is meant to be a global standard. So in some places there are no waste management facilities at all, and that's just open food or other parts are but burnt out in the open. So controlled combustion means it's in a fit, permitted plant facility. And even though food banks <coughs> might consider like be considered a destination, they would be a consumed part, and then the food bank on what they didn't consume or did would they would have to classify their destinations too, right? Yeah, right, exactly. So the, the food that goes is donated to the food bank is goes is that is that white box on the far far left. It goes with it was it was meant to be consumed, but to your point. Whoever whomever is the food waste generator, whether it's a food bank who is now removing it from the food supply chain from that going to feed people, or a farmer who's plowing it in, or um, you see they're not harvested and plowed in is one of the options. Animal feed compost, those are three common destinations for, for farmers. Everybody has food waste, in quotes, of some sort has a possible destination there. But it's considered lost and waste as if it's not consumed. I mean, that's the line. It's removed from the food supply chain. Yeah, whether you call it lost, whether you call it waste, whether you call it not eaten, whether you, you know, this. And there are, the reason we all, waste is regulatory driven in some parts of the world. So, you know, my waste is not your waste. So guidance around what the unifying metric is, is it pounds, like mm -hmm. the greenhouse gas protocol yeah. with CO2, E, is it something similar, is it financial dollars? The standard requires a weight, reporting a weight, um, as a common metric, because that's not influenced by currency or other factors. But obviously a lot of people, they want to express the weight in other metric, in other terms, whether it's financial value, nutritional implications, environmental impact. So the document itself, it's the full standard, the 160 pages of it, has a lot of guidance on how do we, how do you actually uh, implement the requirements of the standard. And there's, there's, this is just, this is the, the definitions of it. Um, do you want me to go into any more detail, or not right now? I, I don't think any detail yeah. right now. We can get to it if people have questions on it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is there guidance on when it becomes waste? In other words, the difference between a like, food processor uh, like does it become waste as soon as he intends not to use it for food, or at the actual site of one of those ten items? Because that has an impact on transportation. Right. So the, what the standard says is, if, so the standard allows me to report in conformance with the standard, uh, and the key thing is to actually just declare what is in your scope. So the the, the, the standard does not make it uh, say this is or is not waste. It allows for the user to find based on their own goals. So if somebody's interested in a, a food security goal, for instance, the FAO is interested in reducing hunger. So the, the big FAO statistic we hear mentioned all the time, that's actually only the food component. It's only the green, and it's all 10 destinations. 
That's different than just the EPA's definition. They're focused on resource efficiency. But the EPA, same thing, focused on resource efficiency. So they're measuring food and inedible carbon, <coughs> and maybe only going to some of the destinations. So it's up to the user of the standards to, to, to define what they mean by food loss and waste, and it's driven by their goals. So the, the why, why you're measuring and what you're trying, the, the objective of why to look at food waste in the first place, will drive what you put in your scope. And then it, it also drives how we measure, because again, you know, why you're measuring, you're trying to set real accurate baseline to um, have some targeted reductions you want to quantify over time, you need a more accurate figure than if you're trying to get a general understanding. So that drives also the method and how you actually go about measuring. Is there a place in the standard to do this by food type so that once you measure it, you can actually manage changes in how you're classified? Yeah, so um, I'll just go to the side. This, what the, the, there are eight requirements, and, and one of the main ones is this declare what is quantified. Um, the time frame, obviously, you know, declare whether it's before yeah. 12 months or a different time frame. The material types we talk about, destinations we talk about, and this boundary on the far right. One of them is, is food category because, again, you want to know what's in the inventory. And uh, how specific you get is up again to the user. Um, and a retailer may just say, oh, you know, it's all food and beverage. I'm, I'm looking at everything that's in the store. Uh, a tomato processor might be only looking at canned tomatoes. So it's up to the user to determine how actually granular you want to be in, in the measurement. But, and there's, for each of these, on the, the, the boundary dimension, like for food category, there are common global international classification systems that the standard recommends using so that you're using a common classification system in defining, you know, whether it's cheese, ice cream, milk, whatever is in the, in the inventory. So what, what would you take beyond why this isn't important as a business case to do this? And what does the standard give us that, that we need? I mean, so fundamentally, it's important if you're going to set any kind of benchmark on to improve and reduce waste, you kind of need to know where you're starting from. So, you, like the hop, wait, I'm going to mess this up because I waste you, but Wayne Gretzky analogy, you don't know where you're going if you don't know. No, wait. You never make the shots you don't take. Yeah, that one is one that you don't, don't know. Don't follow the popular one. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, if you don't know where you're headed, you don't know where you're going, something like that. But basically, yeah, I, I can't argue my analogies are straight. But, um, it, it, you know, you need to know where, where your starting point is in order to to, to, make, to measure progress. Um, and I think another important piece, and this goes to Andrew's point, is uh, acknowledging that there is a problem. So measurement is important because it acknowledges what, what exists, that there that this is how much is not is being removed from the food supply chain, whatever that means. It's not being sold, it's not being eaten. Um, and so acknowledgement is first, I feel like we're talking about 12 steps. Acknowledgement is the first, <laughs> first step in your identifying you have a problem. Um, so again, that's, that's why uh, the measuring is important. And what, what the standard allows is for us to all have a consistent language so that when somebody says, well, my food waste is X, and somebody else says, well, mine is Y, you, the next question is, well, what do you mean by food waste? And are we even talking apples to apples? Or are we talking apples to steak? And we're you know, really fundamentally talking about two very different things that should not be compared. Because I think that's important because a lot of folks are saying, if I'm taking it to a place where a secondary value is achieved, like compost or animal feed, then it's not waste anymore. But that's kind of contrary to what you're saying in terms of the protocol, right? Well, uh, it's I guess categorized I know. It's, differently. Yeah, right? what I'm saying is, if you're gonna, when you call it waste, the standard says, tell us what you mean. And then it's up to the, you know, the group, it's up to somebody else, an external factor, external to, to the standard to say, is wasted. Mm -hmm. Or not. I mean, again, we very much in the standard, the, the term food loss and waste is only used in the name of the standard. Other than that, it's all about um, going back to these components. What components? This is unpacked, right? You select the material types, the, the red, uh, green, and the red arrow, you select the destination. And then whether you consider compost waste or not, is, it's a value based decision. But it's important to say what, where it's gone because. As we saw on Steve's pyramid, between composting and feeding people, there's animal feed and other options. So that's a, you know, it's an important part of the discussion about what destinations we're talking about. Hi. Yeah. Hi. What, who's target audience for this? Uh, anybody who wants to measure? And any, like, any, yeah, I mean, a food waste generator who wants to know, get a handle on their own waste. So that's for internal uses. Mm -hmm. um, and external groups, you know, the UN has a sustainable development goal to tar target 12.3 to cut food waste in half. The, the nation has a food waste goal to cut 
food waste in half. Um, so this is a standard that allows um, common definitions to be had at that meta level, but then also internally, or for internally, for, you know, if you look at a corporate level, for companies, even amongst their own, themselves, to say, well, my store and your store, let's let's get our measurements uh, and use a common language so that we can see why store one is different from store two and different from store three. And are you also aggregating, like for the, for the folks who are to use this, will you be a, a, a hub for aggregating, uh, you know, in the same way that the protocols have, if they're reporting that? So the, the, the tenant pr protocol now is not to be a central hub. I, I hear this question a lot. There is a desire to have a central hub of somebody to collect the data mm -hmm. at a national level in a confidential, anonymized, probably way <laughs> of some sort. Um, the, similar to the greenhouse gas protocol, the, their, the uh, food loss we stand will probably spawn different derivatives that either World Resources Institute and others will create or other organizations. We've you know, heard from different consultants and auditing firms and others saying, well, you know, is, is there an opportunity for us to help people using, use the standard? We said, yes. <laughs> uh, go out there and you know, be profitable and make a business out of this. Yeah, that was exactly my question, the target audience and then translation question. So if you have so, uh, a business in China that speaks a certain kind of food waste and then you have someone in the US that has a different metric for calculating that food waste, are, is there a way to translate one metric <coughs> through your protocol into another metric that can translate X amount of food waste over here, Y amount of food waste over here, um, the nutrition value loss over here might be weight loss somewhere else? So there's not a tool that allows you to do that now. I mean, that'd be a good opportunity for maybe somebody to create it. But what you can do is, and as you can, if you read the methodology of the two reports, a Chinese number and a US number, you you know the key is to then unpack it and say, well, you know that that the day and the, the important piece would be, of course, having information about the methodology that was used. Um, so if somebody's documented their, their measurement, you can you can go back and backcast and look to compare um, two different data sets and at least see, well, are they talking about, you know, but, you know material types is kind of the easy one. Are they talking about food that was um, just that part that was intended to be consumed, or are they also including the shells, pump, pump, uh, bones, rinds, pits, and you know that would be inedible in that cultural context. So I do when you collect data for a protocol, do you get all of these all of this information and then put it into so the protocol is not, not, not collecting the data. The protocol is simply the group of organizations that develop the standard. Mm -hmm. So what we need, what we, you know, what it sounds like is needed now is, is or there's an interest in having a common hub to you know, someone, some organization that's neutral enough to collect the data. Um, that's that's something we should discuss <laughs> offline, I guess, to figure out you know, what would that look like. What's the need? Is it, you know, is it within a you know business? Trade association, just for the companies feel comfortable only in that kind of more closed setting, or is it a public database that everybody can contribute their data to? And you know, what would that look like? Um, well, I just want to do some visioning too. I mean, let's take it out five years. Let's say five years from now, and just perspective from the three of you. What does it look like in five years for you, Steve? Like, what would you like to see? Um, what I'd like to see, and what I expect to see, perhaps two different questions. Um, I, I would be delighted if we could have a hub that we could contribute to, then you could contribute to, and everybody could update as it came along. Because frankly, what I learned today was that Harvard has their food waste under control. It's feeding people. You know, in, there's very little going in, in outside of, of people on this. So my database that says there's you know six thousand students here producing this much waste is now wrong. For this point, I can't change all the points, but somebody could, in, in a crowdsourcing sort of way, update the map with the latest information, and and that would be wonderful. And will never happen on a government website. Okay, we don't have protections for that. Um, you know, the worst that would happen is, is is the junior high kids in some school would go in and mess with it. You know, and and they will do that. Um, you know, and you'll also get ads for inappropriate things on there. Um, and you'd also get people looking for a business advantage who could post things for their company that were wrong or inaccurate or post bad things for other companies. So the government's probably never going to do crowdsourcing 
on a public platform. But they're going to be reporting against the 2030 goal to reduce it. But so. we're definitely going to be having something that does that once we decide how, you know, there will be an EPA site that will, will map progress in that direction. And hopefully people can input that and then after it goes through a, a government filter, can get put, it, put up on the map. And that's what I expect will happen. What about for you, Andrew? Yeah, so I mean, first of all, I think the protocol is a huge achievement. And I think in some ways, the first step in all this is it's like holding a mirror up to all of us and saying, waste, what do you mean? Because what it shows is the ambiguity that's inherent in the term and the way we use it is very personalized and there's a lot of judgment and filter that's often built into it and indeed that's part of the stigma that sometimes makes it difficult to work with so this forces us to unbundle it and I think there will be you know the reality is at a hundred plus pages it's pretty complicated even in even in shorter form it's an abstract way of thinking I think it's absolutely rigorously done and done very very well it's going to take time for people to learn it contend with it really wrap their heads around it there will be iterations undoubtedly over so your five-year horizon I'm, I'm sure this will evolve but what we do know right is we have commitments from the consumer pack uh, consumer goods forum to a report using it. Um, we have expectations, I would imagine, that all of the sort of sponsoring entities will be using it. And so we would expect that there will begin to be sort of artifacts of people reporting using these tools and then be, people will become familiar with how to actually recognize, oh, I have a like inventory and I don't have, I have an unlike inventory. We can't do that comparison because they don't compute. And, and we will build those muscles. And I think probably within five years, we'll say, okay, we built some muscles. I, I think it'll still be a, a growing process. Um, and at the same time, I think there'll be a very fertile ground for a lot of innovation around building proxies and models and all the sorts of, whether it's translation like you asked about over there, or it's, you know, it's, it's very, it's internal within companies scaling these things. There's going to be a lot of ability to use this to start to construct meaning out of it. But I don't think WRI creates that meaning. I think the meaning is created by the user, right. and there will probably be a universe of tools to assist with that. Mm -hmm. And actually to add that to that, you reminded me to the... Um, the European Union is the other example. Of they they have uh, are proposing to come up with a reporting method for the the 28 whatever number it'll be then. Yes, yeah. <laughs> two months ago, 28 member states. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just with the member states, forget the number. Um, but with the European Union as part of a circular economy package, they're talking a lot about. Uh, food waste and reducing it because you know, Europe's run out of landfill space way before we have here in the U.S. So for them, it's, it's been a more critical issue for a longer time. And from a resource efficiency perspective, they have defined food waste as the green, the food, and the not the inedible, the, um, the red arrow. And of those destinations, it's, they picked eight out of those ten as, as their definition of waste. So animal feed is not considered waste by the EU, and nor is biomaterial, bio-based materials, and biochemical processing. So that's one example of you know, a group external to the, the standard who is using these definitions and w isn't, doesn't tend to set up a reporting mechanism. They still have to, they haven't figured that out either, but that's you know, they're further along than we are in the US anyway, and they're thinking right now. Mm -hmm. Kai, yeah. you, sorry. No, you, go ahead. you and I talked about this, and the one thing that bothered me was not following the, the European Union example. Um, because it, I can't get over seeing animal feed there. It really bothers me, you know this. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, in my work, the only way we've been successful is to come up with a zero organic waste plan and then work backwards and say, okay, now we don't have any waste anymore. What do we do with all this? And we've come up with a solution for every single component. And the only way to do that is to suggest that none of it's waste. Mm -hmm. As long as people see it as waste, they're going to treat it as waste. Yeah. And so that really bothers me that, that you know, you might talk about. Yeah, I mean, you know, in theory, you want to keep it all out of the yellow box. That, that could be really, you know, really hard because that, that means the inedible parts, right? You have to find a way to feed those to people. And food spoils, what do you do about that? I mean, getting nothing in the yellow box is kind of not really realistic because but it's, but food it's, goes bad. should be going after it. So that, should be the, that should be a beacon on the hill. Yeah, source reduction, feeding people, and keeping it out of the yellow box in the first place. Good question back here, too. Um, a lot, but um, I think I was going to ask whether this tool can be considered um, something that can be targeted specifically for quality management departments within businesses. Um, and you know, they have that from the quality management from the perspective of the communication system within an organization that gets all of the parties and the departments involved in targeting this problem. And has there been any kind of focus on what part of a business and what kind of angle on business you're looking at? 
for participation with this school or with Lean Path or with any other solution? First. Sure. So, I mean, that's a really interesting question. Like, where is the role of process improvement or quality in in this in this dialogue? And um, sort of unpacking that, I guess, you know, what we have seen is that in very few food service operations, is other than healthcare, where there really is a, a very established process improvement sort of discipline and a fair amount of traction with Lean and Six Sigma, there tends to be less of that sort of uh, capability inherent in the management structures but yeah I mean this we think that data-driven discovery and team-based problem solving and sort of all of the elements whether it's sort of you know lean or six sigma or whatever derivative it is we think all that stuff plays a role here um, and this can become sort of a tool to structure those conversations in a meaningful way um, but I think in at least in the in the you know, you've got to have that department to begin with to work on it um, and I think obviously bigger companies and companies with high stakes have those departments and I think the average restaurant obviously is going to have a tougher time. So, um, but I think what's nice about the protocol is you have the ability to kind of scale it up and down for the level of rigor you're, you're going for. Question. Yes, it seems like um, everyone is doing a really fantastic job of measuring what is going where and one thing that I'm interested in is when it becomes food waste, why did it become food waste? At the mm -hmm. farm level, was it due to spoilage? Was it due to <clears throat> not having enough labor to harvest it in the first place? Um, and in food production, was it because of, you know, wrongly estimating how much food needed to be prepared? Um, is anyone measuring that? Yes. Do you think there's... <laughs> yeah. Andrew, That's like, what he does. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> right, I mean... So the problem, right, taken to an ad absurdum, there's, we could, there's a lot of stuff we'd like to measure, right, all, all the way down. And, and when, we, when we create a waste fact, so if something gets thrown away, that's a fact, there's about 15 or 20 dimensions that sort of uh, can be attached to that fact in our world. And so probably the most relevant ones are going to be, you know, what is it? Why was it discarded? How much of it? When? You know, date, time, who, if we can accomplish that? Um, but yeah, the why provides critical context. I think that, you know, that's when you started, I remember we actually had this conversation about all the sort of dimensions of the fact table early on and I think concluded, I mean, there's so much overhead just to get to the point where you can have that conversation. There's a lot of structure above it. But yeah, I mean, the micro tracking, yeah, if you're willing to really commit to regular measurement, you can find out where it came from, why, where it's going to go exactly. You can attach it to specific events. You can attach, I mean, there's all sorts of opportunity to get into the sort of the, the actual surgical process of understanding that thing and then working it backwards. So that was too subjective to put into this one? Yeah, so I'll show you the, uh, here's, here are the parts of the main document. Chapter 11 is reporting causes of FLW, <laughs> but it's a recommendation and not a requirement. So the setup of the, you know, an accounting and reporting standard it allows you to say, I have reported, accounted for, quantified, and reported in conformance with the standard. And there's no you can consensus around the way to report causes. There's there's so many different scenarios from growers to restaurants and everything, you know, between that coming up with a common definition of causes and a, you know the, the the way to you know put it in as a requirement was not feasible at this point. Now you can certainly blow out this chapter on, on causes and do more work on it. Maybe there's some more requirements or just more guidance that could be could be put out. But this again, the, the spirit of the standard is what are the key things that you know can be required by any kind of entity to be reported upon. Um, and this is just the structure of the document to say that there's a lot there and a lot of guidance. <laughs> but we do we do address causes in the. Uh, I'll just quickly show the. Um, this is this is uh, the eight requirements, and it's. Quite, it's actually quite straightforward, even though there's a lot of text on this particular slide, but you know, the requirement is to base, base FLW accounting reporting on keep reporting principles of transparency and completeness, good, just good practice. Account for and report in terms of the weight. Uh, number three is all about the scope that we've spent most of the time talking about. Uh, what's the time frame, material type, destination, boundary, and then some related issues about like excluding packaging and what to do if water's been added. And then you know, three quarters of the way down the list here, Requirement four is just describe the quantification method used. You know, you do waste composition analysis, a diary, a survey, it's kind of good market research practices describe the method used. And that, I mean, the, the, the next 
a few requirements are more about the quantification method. So this really is like what what can we boil down to uh, as re what we make to requirements that anybody around the world, regardless of resources, right? Somebody who doesn't have a lot of money, somebody who has an extensive budget, could report on. So we have consistent inventories that can be then compared and contrasted um, globally with you know in an incredible way. So. Again, yes, boil down to the key eight requirements <laughs> for, the, for, for globally relevant standard. Andrew, when you talk about business case, and you're, I mean, you've been doing this for a long time. <clears throat> yes, I've like, gotten gray hair while I've been doing it. What, <laughs> like, why isn't this still more just acceptable across the board to go down and do the categorization and, the, and like, get in the details of what your waste looks like? What is it? So why is it that people yeah, I mean, don't? What, work? What, why is it not just taking off and accelerating so fast? What's the biggest barrier? Yeah, well, so fortunately, I think there is a there has been a turn, and so if you if some of you are familiar with the Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm sort of um, the curve for technology adoption, there's sort of early adopters and innovators, and then there's this chasm where a lot of innovation gets stuck that doesn't cross over into the early normal and normal population. And I think food waste tracking for a long time. Uh, was an innovator and early adopter initiative and I think really in the last you know say six to twelve months we we've been saying no I think it's jumped the chasm like we've actually we're now seeing it on the other side and I think we're seeing a lot of big food companies um, making this an expectation that they're going to measure so for example uh, Accor, which is not a very well-known brand in the U.S., they own the Sofitel hotels in the U.S. There's only seven of them, I think, but they have 4,000 hotels globally, and they own brands like Pullman and Ibis and Novotel. And they made a commitment; they're going to cut food waste 30% by 2020, and they're going to measure food waste in every hotel that they have in the world. So that's a that would be an example, I think, of people sort of crossing. But to you, I think the interesting you're sort of saying, where's the resistance, and why hasn't it happened? So for everyone. And I think number one, there's there's still uh, a lot of hesitation around um, just I think at the front line fear of looking bad because waste is a you know is not a good thing and people sort of feel there's this sort of negative aura to it that in some cases they may not want to sort of jump into it so there's kind of a reflex of like hey we got this under control so maybe a little bit defensive that's been one part of it there's concern about labor people say oh do we have the people to do this this is going to be onerous it's one more thing for us to do <coughs> what we found of course is no one adds labor doing this um, and you know I was explaining this earlier I think to someone in this room that there's there's you know if you can talk to your employees about having meaningful work and explaining that what they're doing is meaningful really makes a difference that there are very few employees who don't who don't appreciate that and if you can tell them they're going to save their time and energy by not making things that aren't wasted they that typically pretty popular too and so over time if you do find that you're reducing you're going to have less work arguably less wasted effort there may still be just as much work but less wasted effort associated with those products so there's a win-win in all this but you just have to work through unwinding all this stuff the fear the fear of looking bad, the fear of labor and effort, and you know not achieving results. But you know, as long as we keep getting a bigger and bigger stack of people who said this worked for me, you know, it becomes safer and safer and safer for people. And that's that adoption curve where we got enough people in that early adopter camp now that the normals who were kind of looking at it for a while are going, okay, that feels safe. And it comes out in interesting, interesting uh, benefits. I was at a, a facility. Uh, that is is not sending any of their uh, scraps from the kitchen or, or plate scrapings. None of it goes anywhere but into a certain bin. It's an insincorator slash slurry system that goes into an anaerobic digester. Anyway, the kitchen has no nothing organic coming out of it except for into this one slot. Um, the employees are happier because they're not wasting anything. It's all going to this one reuse function. The kitchen is cleaner. The dock is cleaner. I went out in the back of the restaurant, and if, you know, those of us who've been in the waste world go in the back of the dock, and it's it's a horrible place generally. It reeks and it's covered with grease and there's flies all over. This was clean. I actually climbed up and looked in the dumpster to see what was wrong, and and it turned out that it was dry. Right? They're not throwing away a lot of water, and certainly not any dirty water. Um, the employees are happier. They get to work in there. The restaurant that I was looking at is saving hundreds of dollars a month on garbage can liners because they don't have wet waste anymore. They don't need it. Who would have thought? 
You know, this is the third of the technologies that are entering this thing called net zero. Okay, energy was first, water is second, and now we're looking at, at organic waste um, as as a big thing. The first two paths are pretty well trodden. We know what net zero energy looks like and net zero water looks like, and we can do that. The technologies have been developed. We're developing the technologies for this one. Back in the um, my question is for Steve. Um, I'm from Iowa, and we did a theoretical study on all the food waste generated in the state that was industrial, commercial, and institutional. And a year later, I was doing food waste sorts at school, at, at schools throughout Iowa. I went back and cared and took the actual waste sort data, and I compared it to our theoretical data. Our theoretical data is is very conservative. Most of the schools generate double what our theoretical data says they're generating. So my question for you is, you know, as, as you have this theoretical data that you're generating, have you ever tested it for accuracy? Sure. Uh, we, we have not tested this directly as we're gathering it. We've used other people's. So if you had published that, for example, mm -hmm. that report would end up in our database. Okay. And that's, that's, that's we're online. Our database is online. I'll make sure I get it. Okay. If I if I haven't already, it's possible. Okay. Um, but also, uh, NRDC um, is looking at a couple different cities, and they're going to take our data and do exactly what you did, and tunnel into the institutions we're looking at, and give us real and surprisingly embarrassing numbers of what actually happens compared to what we estimate. Okay. Um, and I'm fairly sure that there will be at least regional differences. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 just the other point to raise is, I don't know if you were able to tell from the methodology, but are you using the same scope? <laughs> because right. if the estimated scope, say, you know, excluded edibles and it was just a landfill, and you're looking at it was when, when any of those 10 destinations right. that included you know, the edible parts, you're going to have just not comparing the same thing. For instance, right. if, you, if you're going to a composter, it's perfectly legitimate and, in, in fact, useful to put in your paper napkins. You know, no other destination wants paper. You know, it, it just changes everything. Uh, just as a point of clarification, since the U.S. goal came up the 2030 goal and, and the measurement, there's actually two parts that we're using to measure both for the baseline and reporting progress. One is um, using USDA's food loss data. So that's being defined as the amount of food that's produced for human consumption that isn't consumed by humans. And on the food waste side, that's coming from EPA's data set that's under the um, what used to be known as the characterization report, but now the facts and figures report. Um, so it's a little different than some of the data sets, but you know we're, we're all working on kind of developing, especially within EPA, new data sets and better data sets, which is what some of what Steve's data fits into. Well, that, that brings an interesting question because I started thinking about this data and, and things that change that you don't realize are going to change your food waste generation rates. And I, I started wondering if we got our factors for calculating school waste before the National School Lunch Program mandates in 2012. Mm -hmm. Because that's very much affected the amount of food waste coming out of schools. And I forget, who, who's the scientific law that says once you study something, you change it? You know, <laughs> you know as soon as you do a, a waste audit at an elementary school, it changes. You know, next week and next month it'll be different. The following year, when the new students come in, it changes again. We measured for that. Were we? <laughs> no, we have. We come in and sort of secretly recorded all the waste before we deployed a, a daily measurement program just to see what the differential is on day one of that program. And yeah, it's a well, twenty-five to thirty percent reduction yeah. on day yeah. one. That's what Ashley Zanoli's found too, and then in a few household diaries, you know. <laughs> uh, question, proposition, um, more for Andrew and perhaps Thomas. I'm wondering if you've seen any customers uh, make procurement decisions around from suppliers who are measuring. Uh, and I ask that because in the climate change front with the GHG protocol, when, when Walmart said, I want all my suppliers to start measuring their carbon footprint, I'm going to make decisions around that, and then that eventually measurement led to management. I'm wondering if the measurement side can be a starting point for upstream changes and whether companies like Sodexo uh, on the food service or McDonald's, Walmart, big 
big companies that have robust supply chains, whether they can play a role in encouraging a measurement. Yes, I mean, look, I think measurement, it's, it's the elixir for everything, right? But, but I mean, really, it doesn't I mean that transparency changes everything. And you can look to the UK and the Courtauld commitments and voluntary agreements to be transparent and how, how that has changed the conversation. So um, in terms of actually seeing it take place, um, I, I think you see little, little bits of it. In the contract food management space, you have clients and, and, and others who are more going to be directly familiar with this who, who very much are evaluating sustainability practices when they're choosing which partner they want to select and they're interested in what they're doing. And so one of those conversations could become about measurement. I, I don't think it, that that's been broadly the case. In the hotel sector, certainly green meeting credentials are a big part of winning meeting business. And so, so I think we're sort of seeing it right now. The conversation is largely general sustainability, probably getting more specialized. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think there's a huge opportunity for if you want to look at where transformation could occur, uh, particularly, I think there's some legislation floating around the federal government on at forcing federal contractors who have food to uh, who have food service elements to actually report on that waste. And that would be that would be a really great, great game changer in terms of creating a cascading effect. Last question. Chris. Really, uh, Sorry, two more. <laughs> really quick question, Steve, and just to clarify. The data points that you're talking about and that you highlighted will have institutions and the food waste or waste generated at a high and low. Is that the accurate for, for Whenever we have uh, two different methods that we couldn't choose between, you get a range. Yes, so you get a high and low. Food, and organic and non-organic? Wasted food. Just, uh, so just so I understand, see. What's, what's my language here, Kai? What's your language? <laughs> so if a student at Harvard went onto the website, they would see what the EPA has determined the amount of wasted food or how, but, but they would see that number. Yes. And that would then become the truth, no matter what it was. <sighs> I'm just asking, just checking in. And, and in, in this case, um, our number would be wrong. Okay, I just wanted to do a whole yeah, picture. Yeah, it, it's an estimate. One more? Is there any more here? So, I'll, I'll make uh, two points. In terms of um, how we measure the achievement of, uh, of that goal, so, you know, a colleague of the had kind of talked about the, the work that we're doing in terms of rolling up state data, and we're also trying to make sure that the state data is collected in the same way. You know, and so that that's a, that's a working problem. Right? So at some point, collecting that data in the same way, rolling it up, will be the mechanism of trying to figure out at a, I would say, a sub macro level whether we're making progress towards 2030 goal. Right? So which is different than what Steve is just talking about. Right? So we need. Oh yeah. To, yeah. Sure. Sure. So the other question, I, I just for Andrew, you know, it's um, you do a lot of work on the supply chain. So have you seen? Based on the application of your tools and it's linked to those practices in individual companies, resulting in being pushed on downstream of the supply chain as a best practice that's been taken up. Hmm. So that's it. yeah. Let me let me sort of think about that for a second. So what we have seen is that when you have a sort of multiplexed group of operations that have similar profiles and some of them are measuring that learnings from that certainly transition horizontally so we see that uh, for most of our customers there isn't much downstream because they're they are the point of sale typically uh, and so um, we do see that the measurement process catalyzes discussions around donation and diversion that those two conversations happen so to that extent I guess it does um, but um, mostly, I would just say, once you see the best practices, it's a little bit more of a horizontal transference. So do you think that's going freely, or is there some competitive question that inhibits that sharing of that? Yeah, so it's, it, is it competitive or pre-competitive, I guess, is yeah. the question. And I've seen two different schools of thought on it. I, there, I think there are a lot of people who would say this is the, the right thing to do, and it's 
there's an ethical and moral dimension to it. We just need to do it because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And then there's a reality that the more waste you reduce, the more efficient you are, which means the more pricing advantage you might have. Uh, and also the uh, sort of degree of innovation in your in your program might be a differentiator. So I think we're kind of on that. There's still an uneasy. Um, there's a lot of cooperation, but not a lot of disclosure. If that makes any sense. There's sort of yeah. general communication, but but competitive entities are not sharing data. We don't. We're not granular enough to make the business decision. We've seen two uh, national donors that have, have reduced. In fact, one very large donor that's just getting started in the hamburger business is actually making a decision on cost savings impact that they've had. I mean, he started with the tax savings, but now that they've actually done testing, they've realized that even though their scheduling was very good, that by analyzing measuring, you know, like we were talking about, that they're actually able to uh, to reduce their cost and become a competitive advantage. And what I can talk about with Chipotle has been able to reduce their donations, I mentioned this in Andrew Breakfast, by 70% because they reevaluated how they were handling the food that they were processing and making it more often. So that does have a, a, a cost impact and a reduce of, of the product pool to use. So, uh, I mean, they weren't wasting, they were already zero waste. But they have a cost advantage now because they're they're waking less because they got more efficient because they're making. I don't know if that goes at your question, but it is. It, it now, from our standpoint, we're now able to use cost impact in addition to tax savings so as a point to drive home on uh, the company. Uh, company to and Bill, for those who don't know, Bill leads Food Donation Connection, and oh, right. it has been just absolutely a pioneer in this industry. So, well, donation. Is a as a form of measurement, right? So it right. suits those two you know, those two benefits, both socially, but also right. by donating, you're measuring and able to look at right. making your operation more efficient and driving that down. Yeah. Which and more and more that thanks to sustainability push, more and more that's what's driving. I think that's what's going to really accelerate uh, programs within the industry because donation is great and it's important to people. But when you start impacting your bottom line and your efficiencies, mm -hmm. it really starts to gain traction. Mm -hmm. I think everybody, we have a, it's a stop and then we have a 3.45 start for the next session. So I just want to thank our, our panelists. And, and off to the next thing.